This is Dateline News and Conversation. Got a great show and a great guest for you tonight. My friend just recently returned from China, Jeff J. Brown. Jeff, welcome back to the show. Always a pleasure, Regis. You were on the show a month or so ago, and it was an incredible show. I asked you so many questions about Russia, about China. Is there democracy there? Are they capitalists? Do they have freedom? Are they being monitored constantly? The credit system, da 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 da. You've just returned from, I think, a month long visit to China. I want to remind people you previously spent some 16 years living in China. You're an expert on what's going on in that country. Maybe one of the only Westerners that has a clue. Jeff, first of all, what motivated you to go back? China is my muse. I mean, it's it's the greatest show on earth. You know, I went back. I couldn't go back for three years because of uh, COVID, and I regret moving away to try to retire in Thailand. I think it was a, a huge mistake, but that's the way things worked out. Got stuck here in France for retirement and then got stuck here with COVID. Went back for a month in May by myself. Then went to the United States for 10 days on the West Coast in Portland, Oregon, in the United States. And then went back to the United States in Oklahoma City for three weeks, the first three weeks of September. And then I had two days to repack my bag and was in China from September 22nd until October 20th, almost almost 30 days. So I have seen, and I live here in France, so I have seen the United States, I've seen the, you know, the, the wokest, the wokest, you know, Portland, you know, Oregon, California scene. I've seen the red state scene where I grew up in Oklahoma. And I've been now spent two months in China uh, since May. And I don't, Regis, you just cannot. It's so hard to convey to people what's going on in China compared to the United States and the rest of the West. It's just, it's mind boggling. Okay, so let's start with this recent trip to China. And then I'd like to talk about the comparison between what you found in China to what you found on your return to France and what you experienced previously in the United States. Uh, what you, you had, you attempted to show little vignettes of what you experienced every day. How many cities did you go to? What parts of China? I so, went to, well, first, first off, the difference between this, the trip in May, I was by myself. And so, I speak, read, and write fluent Chinese, so I'm directly plugged into the Chinese. I talk, and I and, and I I don't talk to elitists, you know, like you know writers at the New York Times and BBC and the New Yorker magazine. <laughs> I'm talking to taxi drivers, restaurant owners, small business people, farmers, factory workers hairdressers, masseuses, people trying to make a living, shopkeepers. That's who I'm talking to. And when this time, though, I traveled with a colleague, uh, an older woman who's, who's a colleague of mine, and it really, really opened my eyes to, to things that I never ever saw before because I just took it for granted. I mean, I, I speak the language, but this lady who's, you know, almost as old as me, can't even speak English. She only speaks French. And so I was having to do all this translation, Chinese, French, 
Prince Chinese for a month. And I just watching how the Chinese reacted to her, to an old woman was absolutely a revelation for me. She was revered. She was absolutely respected. She the, 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 the people were just wanted to help her so much as an older woman. I'm an older guy, but you know she, uh, but this lady is an older woman and the way that the Chinese treated her just absolutely blew me away. She was treated like a queen. And maybe I'm, I don't think I'm that well treated as an older guy, but she was treated like a goddess. And that really opened my eyes up to how much the Chinese venerate old people, venerate grandparents. And we told people, you know, I've got three, she's got three grandkids. I've got <coughs> one grandkid. It was just like the whole world opened up for us and showing pictures of her grandkids and my grand my granddaughter and our and our children, her three children and my two children. And it was just like this is the most amazing thing I have ever seen in my life. And we met scores and scores of people all over China, well, Southern China, Central and Southern China. We have invitations. I now have what I, I have now connected with so many people on WeChat. We have invitations to go everywhere, all over China. They welcome, we, we, we want you to come. Total strangers, you know, who want, who, who, who want to get to know us. So to let you know where, I, where we went, we spent about 10 days in Shenzhen, which is the <coughs> city just north of Hong Kong. I was shocked to learn that it's, gosh, when I was there in 2019, it only had like 13 or 14 million. And I, I saw a sign in the metro that was saying 17 million plus one. So now Shenzhen has grown by 4 million people in the last five years, and you wouldn't even know it. And and so anyway, Shenzhen, you know, Tencent, uh, Huawei, ZTE, it's the it's the Silicon Valley for the for, for the whole world. It's the the great high tech DGI, the drones. I mean, there's just dozens of dozens of tech companies there, and I lived there for three years from 2016 to 2019. It's an amazing city. It's just amazing. And so then flew up to Anhui province, which is in the central part of the country. And, and particip we participated in a rural wedding in Huaibei, which is a tiny town. I mean, it's just like in the middle of nowhere. Participated in a rural wedding, then went down to Hefei, and then, which is the capital of Anhui. And Anhui has a reputation for being kind of an armpit of China, but now Hefei, I mean, just this, this, these, these secondary cities we saw, is just staggering, staggering the growth that's going on there. The construction and the apartments and the skyscrapers everywhere. And Hefei is like a tiny town. It only has 10 million people. It's a third, it's a third level city. And so then we went down to Huangshan Yellow Mountain, which is a UNESCO, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And there we met Amir Khan, a good friend of mine, who is a professor at Hunan University in Changsha, <coughs> Hunan. The world's oldest oldest university, of course, Oxford and um, Cambridge will never tell you that, but Hunan was actually open over a hundred years before before Cambridge or or Oxford. Well, he's a professor there, and he and his fiance, Chinese, we met in Hefei, and then we went to Huangshan together. That was really cool. 
Then we trained over <coughs> to Zhang Jiajie. Zhang Jiajie is the inspiration for James Cameron's um, uh, backdrop for the movie, the, the Avatar movies with the floating islands. Unbelievable, unbelievable. And everywhere we're zipping along on high speed trains going 305 kilometers an hour. The trains are so clean, you can eat off the floor. Everywhere we went, the metros, the the, tra the, the train stations, the bathrooms, there's bathrooms everywhere. And they are so clean, you could eat off of their floors. So we get to Zhang Jiajie, stay there for several days. Amazing, just unbelievable. And uh, we we met a, a Buddhist monk uh, and, and, and at Tianmen Shen um, Mountain Temple and got invited it by into his house and at the temple. And again, when you speak the language, it really helps. And then we went down to Guilin, which is very, very famous for the, you know, for the gumdrop mountains and the winding river. We went to that for a few days, went back to Shenzhen. So I saw, we saw, we rented taxis and went out into the countryside, saw little tiny villages, agriculture, talk to people in small towns, you know, talk to farmers. Regis, you have the, the, the fans out there have no idea. There is construction going on everywhere. Every, even small towns, even hamlets. They're building stuff. They're they're constructing stuff. They're 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 widening the roads. They're improving the infrastructure. They're building bridges in the middle. You know, in, in small villages. You talk about productive economy. China's got it. And so I just and then well, anyway I just, and then we come back here. I hope I'm not ranting on too long for you. And it was just, I realized after the way my friend had been treated like a goddess, everywhere we went, grandma, she's grandma. And everywhere she went, she was treated like a goddess. And <clears throat> we and we got back to France. And I, it, it wasn't until we got back that I realized that Westerners, or like that proverbial frog in the pot of water and you start heating it up and the frog doesn't jump out, even though the temperature is getting hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. And I'd say right now, after what I've seen in China and the, the way the people are cheerful and honest and hardworking and industrious and smiling and doing things and producing things and you know, offering services and helping people. And God, I, I dropped something on the, on the ground, on the sidewalk, and immediately somebody would come and pick it up for me. My friend who I, my colleague who I travel with told me how three or four years ago, she's got equilibrium problems. Twice, three or four years ago, she fell down in Gare saint Lagarde, the saint Lazare train station in Paris, with her baggage, went down face first, twice, about six or eight months apart. Now she's got, she's got, she's, she got care, she got it treated. But back then she fell down twice and nobody, this is like one of the busiest train stations in Europe. People walk, stepped over her, walked over her like she was a piece of meat. How do I explain that to the Chinese? I can't. Where's the pride? Where's the community? Where's the where's the sense of helping each other? It's gone in the West. And in, in, in China, it's just all, you know, we, 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 we. Us, 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 you know, let's work together. Twice that happened to her, and she had to lie there on the ground with her face in the concrete for two or three minutes while she got her bearing straight 
and was able to pick herself up and walk out. No Chinese could ever imagine that happening to anybody. Nobody. And so, anyway, it's just, I, if you want me to tell you about about France, I will. It's, it's so no, no. What, awful. What, well, I, I want to ask you a couple of things about China because okay. we had a terrific show a month or so ago that, that really surprised me and I think a lot of people had no idea about what China was really like. This time, you went back and it was more... Uh, not a political search or journey. It was just traveling around and seeing with your own eyes different parts of China. And, and I'd like to know this as, as a Westerner, and I'm living in Russia, and the Russians are very much like that. They, if you fell on the ground, and I did, I broke my hip two years ago late at night, I was surrounded by people who wanted to help. Um, so I, I, are the Chinese, are they, are they wanting to be like Westerners? I mean, they're manufacturing everything under the sun. Are they a consumer society like we are in the West? I mean, how would you describe, I mean, they're, they're growing and they're building all kinds of things, skyscrapers and factories and, producing all kinds of products, are they basically a consumer society or are they a, ho a whole lot more, I don't know, connected to their humanity? I, I mean, I'm really curious about that. Well, they're consumers. I mean, I even took a video. I took a video just walking down the sidewalk. Restaurant store, restaurant store, restaurant store, restaurant store. I mean, there's mil probably tens of millions of small businesses in China selling and offering, selling everything and offering everything. So, I mean, the Chinese are bitcoins. They love to eat. They love to, you know, they, they, they love to, you know, have things. But that's the superficial capitalist. <coughs> That's the superficial capitalist appearance that that Westerners see, and they go, "Oh well, China's China's capitalist." But underneath that is the massive, massive state <coughs> sector, the state-owned enterprises, and even in the the, <coughs> the private sector, Alibaba, WeChat, Tencent. Huawei, ZTE, and thousands of other private companies. They've got Baba Beijing looking over their backs. You know, the government, the government here, you, the, the number one goal of a company in China is to maintain social harmony and economic prosperity for everybody, even if it means making less money. So you have, so you have this this massive expectation by the people. I mean, it's coming from the people, you know. And then the government enforces what the people are asking, and that is, take care of society, take care of people, help people, help people to be prosperous as 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 a family. So yeah, the, it's a huge. I mean, I mean, you just can't you can't walk down the street without being, you know, without someone <coughs> having something to sell you. I mean, it's just everywhere, but, you know, retail. So, yeah. but, but it's got this, ma this massive, massive um, state, state footprint that keeps the, even the private companies in line. And if they get out yeah. of line, the Baba Beijing will tear them a new asshole. I mean, they, 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 they have, they have fined Alibaba and Tencent and Didi, the, 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 the taxi, the taxi rental, the taxi hire thing, hire company, which I use all the time. I mean, they are, they, they the government on, and all these big corporations, they have like a gigantic proctologist 
probe up their backsides watching everything they do. And so there's no, there's not a lot, there's not a lot that, I mean, stuff happens, of course, stuff, of course, happens, but it's a lot harder in China when you've got a government that care, that is listening to the people and the people are saying, we want honest businesses. We want fair businesses, fair trade in country. And then the government imposes what the people are asking. You know, I want to ask you about something that's in the news. Uh, I, I read this today on, on RT, that China dismissed their defense minister. <coughs> uh, I'm sure you read that. Well, there's another one, Ching Gong. Yeah, what what's going on with that? Are they do they figure he wasn't enough of a war hawk? Not not military. I mean, no corruption. He got caught with Ching Gong. Ching Gong, the the former uh, foreign minister, was deposed because he got caught. He got caught having an affair, an extramarital affair, with a woman back in the United States, because he was actually the ambassador in in the United States for a while. They, apparently, they had a love baby. And, of course, he was immediately compromised because if, if he's got a love baby and an, and an, an illicit affair, then he's compromised. They could bribe him. They could, they could blackmail him, everything else. So he was gone. The defense minister, you know, it's hard to describe to, to Westerners how much accountability means in Chinese society. And it all goes back to Confucius. The government is responsible for the people and the people are responsible for the government to do their job. And you are accountable. Names are named. I, I mean, I showed this in my tweets at 44 underscore days. You know, you just walk down the street. Oh, well, looky here. Here's the neighborhood cop. Here's his photo. There's his mobile phone number. There's his badge number. I can pick up the phone and call my local cop. I know his name. When is that ever, ever going to happen in, in the West? I can go down to City Hall and make a complaint. I can make a suggestion. I did it several times. And I actually got results. I actually got results. I complained about a traffic problem on our street. Three weeks later, it was fixed. You have total, and I had to give my name, my ID. But there's accountability, accountability at every level. And this, and Westerners hate accountability. They want to avoid accountability. They want to avoid any responsibility for doing you know, anything you know wrong or whatever in china i mean even the bathrooms regis you go into a bathroom and there's the i even took a picture of the lady <laughs> in one of the in one of the bathrooms we're smiling at each other her photos up on the wall in the bathroom and her phone number's on there if if the toilets are not clean you can call the lady who's responsible for the toilets to get it clean that's accountability at every level. And it does, you know, and it, and it goes up to generals. It goes up to ministers of defense. It goes up to she's in her circle. He has deposed several people higher ranked than the defense minister already. I mean, they're gone because they were corrupt. Yeah. They're not you know what, what I found? What I found interesting, the article said, the Chinese officials have offered no reasons for the decisions. They don't even explain why. At well, least they will. The they will. What happens is <coughs> Ching, Ching Gong, who had the love baby. Now, most Chinese don't know that he had a love baby and had an affair with a famous, with a famous Chinese, I think she's Hong Kong, a famous Chinese um, journalist, quite quite attractive. Both members of the Communist Party 
Well, the first thing they did, they were defrocked. They were kicked out of the party. They both disappeared. And, you know, because the, the, the shame of it. And so I don't know what happened to the love, the love baby. I'm sure her family's probably taking care of it. But later they will go through an entire investigation. I don't know about the Hong Kong lady because she's not really, I mean, she's Chinese, but she was overseas. And she'll probably get let, she'll probably be let go. But he will, there will be an, an entire investigation and he, all the facts will be brought forward. All of this is private. It's all off. Nobody knows what's going on. This is not Western, you know, theater, you know, where cameras are watching Donald Trump in court, you know, that's, that's just, it's absurd. And so they will, he'll, he'll, he's obviously going to be guilty because he got caught. And then they will come out and they will come, they will announce to the, and they'll show his picture in the court. To all the people in China, and I'll be all over the media, and he got kicked out of the Chinese party, Communist Party, and he whatever happened, whatever the punishment's going to be. I mean, adultery, for, you know, probably not a lot, but they'll sit there and say what they won't sit there and say. Well, he was screwing, you know, Wong, Wong, you know, you know who, who, you know, whatever her name is. They're not that. They're much classier than that. They'll just say he was caught be, performing moral turpitude. All the Chinese are going to know what that is. He was screwing somebody. But they're, but, but they're not going to come out and say it. They've, they're too classy for that. They're too sophisticated for that. But the code words will come out that all the Chinese will know he was fucking around. And, and it'll be gone. He'll be gone. He'll he'll disappear. I mean, his, his career is ruined. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Uh, all right. So you went back for a month, and basically to listen to you talk about it, it was some really <laughs> idyllic trip back to this idyllic place. Um, you came back to France, and... <coughs> What what did you find? Uh, well, what was your impression? As as we, you know, we we come back from this amazing trip, and we were treated like we're royalty, and <clears throat> we made all these friends, and people were so nice to us, and everybody was just super super friendly. The service was unbelievable. Everything was just wonderful, and people were smiling and cheerful and hi, ni hao, you know, ni hao, hello. You know, there's 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 a, there's a, there's a, there's, a, there's a civility among the people, not just with foreigners, but you watch it with the other people. And we get back to Charles de Gaulle Airport, and it's just the whole in the first twelve hours, ten plus two. I felt like I was in a dystopian hellhole, and again. And it was a dystopian. It is a dystopian hellhole. Everything was broken. The turnstiles were broken. The ticket composter was broken. The the train was was it was like riding in a scene at Blade Runner, you know, with Decker, the cop, you know, chasing replicants. The people around me were acting like androids. It was just dark and no light, and really it was just lugubrious and depressed and. And the train was barely running. And, and, and the trains now in France stop all the time. The, I don't know about the, the not, not really across, the, but in, 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 in Paris, the trains have to stop all the time because there are homeless people on the tracks. And they go in the tunnels where it's warmer and away from the rain. And there's drug, at, drug addicts on the tracks or someone's committed suicide and jumped in front of a train. So several times, just to get to the damn train station from Charles de Gaulle to San Lazar, we got stopped, and they called it an, an incident on the tracks. 
Well, everybody knows what it is. It's either a drug addict, a homeless person, or someone committed suicide. I, And I'm pretty sure that right before we got to San Lazar, we were only like 50 meters away. And the train slammed on its brakes. People were flying in the car, falling over each other, piled up on the floor. I mean, can you can, can you believe this? It, you know, it just... And my friend explained, well, it's, it's a, it's a driverless, it's a driverless, uh, line 14 driverless. It's all automatic. Well, they need to work on that. They need to work on that algorithm. So people were on the floor, you know, trying to get back up. And I am sure I'm 90% sure since we were only about 50 meters away, a hundred meters away from San Lazar, somebody jumped out onto the track. Because, because, of course, in France, most of the metro stations don't have the glass, have the glass barriers like in China. Every metro station everywhere in China, they've got the nice big glass, high glass barriers so that you can't fall in. People get killed all the time in France on, on the metros because and people fall in, even if they're not committing suicide. They just trip and fall and get killed because they don't want to spend the money. To, to install the barriers. Then we got to get to San Lazar. We have to use our tickets to get into a. And then a woman in broad daylight, Regis, a woman in broad daylight, her her thing wasn't working. And I said, well, let me try mine. So I tried mine. Mine worked. She jumped in front of me. I mean, she was she was ready to leave me because once you use the once you use the QR code once you can't use it again, so she jumped in front of me and ran, ran away in broad daylight. She was ready to leave me, without being able to pass through the turnstile because she used my QR code because hers wasn't working, in broad daylight, in front of everybody. How do I explain that to the Chinese? Luckily the the turnstile kind of wavered and I was able to push through, but, and then, you know, and then our train was delayed two and a half hours because of debris on the tracks. And then, and then our, then our train was again delayed because of a problem on the track. It, it took us almost as long to get from Paris to Cherbourg as it did from Shenzhen to Paris. And then the coup de grace Regis, the coup de grace, we get to Cherbourg. Now, remember, this is not inner city slum. This is not Marseille, you know, drug land. You know, this is not, you know, this is not the, 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 the suburbs of Paris with all the riffraff and <coughs> the drugs and the violence. Cherbourg's a, just a regular old city. It's 250,000 people. We get to the train station and right outside the train station are two mattresses. Two mattresses where homeless people were staying. And there's piles of human feces around the beds. Where's the pride? Where, where's the decency? I mean... It's just beyond, how do I explain that to the Chinese when you can eat off the floors of their train stations? I mean, it's just it's just mind boggling. It just goes on and on. Just the ripoffs and the cost of everything is just exploding. We're poor here. We're poor. We can't afford to live here anymore. We can't. We don't have the money to live in Europe anymore. That's why I want to go back to France. I, we have, we have. Tons of money in China. Everything is three to three to seven times cheaper. So why live here when we, when I can be treated like a a good old you know teacher, old old teacher? People love and respect me and revere me because I'm a teacher and an old guy. So let me ask you this: Obviously, there's there are millions of Chinese who are doing well and have money. Um. Have they begun traveling to the West? 
uh, you know, like the Japanese did for years and years and years. They were everywhere, all over the United States, all over Europe. And, and uh, have the Chinese been traveling outside the country? I mean, yes, sir. I mean, tell me about that. And then if they are traveling, they must be experiencing the same kind of things you just were talking about. Well, first off, <coughs> in Paris, all the signs in the, in the metro in the airport are in Chinese because there are so many really? Chinese. There are so many Chinese. They're in English. <coughs> I'm sorry. I've got laryngitis. They are, there are so many Chinese that love France. And I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm just, I'm sure they face the same indignities. Of course, they don't speak the language, thank God, what they would see and hear and understand. But I'm sure they do. But, you know, I get all the beggars on the streets. <coughs> <clears throat> all the homeless people. I was in Portland, Oregon, a supposedly Tony rich city in Oregon. I saw drug addicts in broad daylight, not just one, but a bunch of them wallowing in their vomit and their feces on the sidewalk. Drug addicts. And you could see, you could see they had their drug gear. No one was doing anything. No one cared. In the in the West, we don't care. We don't care anymore. We don't care about each other. We don't care about our communities. We don't care about anything except number one. So I'm sure, of course, the Chinese, they're going to Eiffel Tower. They're going to, you know, the Louvre. They're going to, you know, the Grand Palais. They're going to, you know, all, all the, the major sites. So they pro and they typically travel in groups. Yeah. With with a Chinese guide, so I'm sure they're really kind of, not all of them, but I think probably most of them are probably pretty protected from you know all, all the horrible stuff that I see. <clears throat> the pickpocketing is so bad now in Paris. You, it's like a it's like a war zone. We were just paranoid the whole time, watching our stuff. I. I put everything inside my, I look like a pregnant man. I had all my stuff inside my shirt. I got, I got pickpocketed last February at, at, at Gare Saint Lazare. I mean, there's pickpockets everywhere. I even had a guy try to pickpocket me um, uh, on this trip, come, going, going to the airport. I caught him, but there's no, there was no cops there to stop me. Well, it was, it was him. Total impunity, no accountability. So, but I'm sure that the Chinese are, you know, that they're their guides and their tour, their tour groups and stuff. Be careful about your belongings. Make sure the zipper on your bag is in, in the front where you can see it. Because if it's in the back, they'll open it up in the back when you're walking and steal your stuff. That's not freedom. In in China, they don't even block their electric electric motorbikes they just leave them unlocked nobody even lo locks up their electric motorbikes that's how honest china is so i'm sure i'm sure that you know they, they probably see you know i don't know if they see the drugs being sold below uh, the eiffel tower i don't know but uh but they they love they love they love france and 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 they'll keep coming because they just love it. You know, you told me in a previous show uh, that the Chinese were never colonizers. They did travel the world, and they <sighs> they were traders. They were trading goods back and forth, and they were interested in culture. You told me this before. Mm -hmm. So what you've just painted is a very stark comparison of how decrepit and corrupt the Western world has become. You're talking about France, but 
It's coast to coast in the United States, from Portland, Oregon to Portland, Maine, from Minneapolis, Minnesota to uh, Fort Myers, Florida. Uh, it's everywhere. And it's a very sad commentary on what has happened to basic humanity in the West. Um, you know, you can talk about Western liberal values. You can talk about wokeism, um, all the rest of it that has basically, in my view, torn apart the last of what was good about humanity. And they're trying to project that on the west of the world. They're trying to project it on Russia. They projected it all across Europe. There are a number of Eastern countries, I think, that are mostly maybe Orthodox and maybe more traditional that are trying to resist it. <laughs> but what I see happening is that Russia and China, two really very different types of politics, types of economic ways of doing business, but basically, I think, defending our basic humanity. I think both those countries, and I know for sure Russia understands that, Russia is fighting not only for survival, but Russia is fighting this war against Western, liberal, woken type of values. I don't know how it's going to end, but... Uh, well, wokeism is DOA in China. The people don't want it. They don't like it. You know, they, they, there is no tittytainment on TV or on the Internet in China because the, it's not the government is saying they don't want it. It's the people telling the government to keep it out. So there's none of this liberaloid. I mean, it happened. You know, there, I remember when we were living when when we were living in China in 1990, 1990 to 1997, and there were reruns of Friends and you know Dallas and all this other you know soul sucking American culture. You know, it was just awful. Well, that that stopped <coughs> with Xi, Xi Jinping in 2012. That all just disappeared. And he started talking about traditional values. You know, sort of like, okay, we went through the, you know, the Western, you know, the Western phase. Let's get back to Confucius. Let's get back to the Tao. Let's get back to Buddhism. Let's get back to socialism, Marxism. Let's get back to, you know, family. And so that's all gone now in, in, in China. If a film in the United if a film from the United States is allowed to be played here, well here, I'm not there anymore, but allowed to be played there. If there's a sex scene, <coughs> all you're gonna see is the, the man and the woman. You know, starting to hug and kiss and fall on the bed, cut, and then they go to the next scene. That's all you're going to see. You're going to see a kiss, and that's it, because that's all the Chinese want to see. They don't want to see all that vapid, soulless, you know, tittytainment, you know, the erotic pornography. Uh, it, I will say their <laughs> their movies can be pretty violent, but you know, especially with with the mafia. You know, Chinese you know, kind of Chinese mafia style movies, you know, the triads and in Hong Kong and all that. But as far as sex is concerned, gay cup gay couples and ads, forget it. It's not gonna happen. They just don't they don't want it to you know marriage is between a man and a woman, period. Which is I think the same thing in Russia. So uh it just it's a totally different world there. And uh, people say, oh, but they're really big in, in the WEF. And, oh, they're really big at Davos. And, oh, they're really big at the World Health Organization. Well, yeah, if you want to, if you need to, if you want to, if 
you want to, you know, defeat the enemy and they invite you into their camp, <coughs> then you're going to play a part. So China plays a part with the WF and the Agenda 2030, which will be used to destroy the West. China will use Agenda 2030 to make China a paradise because it will be for the people and not for the elites. Again, it's so hard for Westerners to understand that democracy decisions are made in China from the bottom up. It's not the Communist Party of China telling the people what to do. It's the people telling the Communist Party of China what they need to do. Everything is turned upside down. And so people people just can't fathom, oh, but it's communist. Well, hey, it's consensual. It's mutual. It's bottom up. It's popular. It's people driven. That's communism. I like it. Mm -hmm.